it's definitely a lifetime ago. And I think throughout those 50 years, there's not a week that goes by that I'm not reminded of that season. It's something that lives with you for the rest of your life. We probably weren't the best players in the league or best players in the country, but we believe that we were. We were overachievers. To me, we were typical Texans. Gritty, tough, hardworking. We overcame a lot of obstacles. You couldn't have picked a better football team in the world than ours. They never said no. They never allowed themselves to be beaten. And because there's many times that teams give up and you wouldn't have that from our team. To be a, a champion, you are now looked at in a different perspective. You represent the University of Texas. You represent what we've accomplished. And it can do a lot for you as an individual, which it did. It gave me a, a life. In the early 60s, Texas emerged as one of the dominant programs in college football. From 1961 through 1964, the Longhorns finished in the top five every season and won their first national championship in 1963. After unprecedented success in the early part of the decade, the Longhorns struggled from 1965 through 1967. The worst three-year stretch of Del Royal's Texas career. They went through three straight years where they had four losses. And in those days, that could get you fired. My dad wasn't just Darrell's defensive coordinator. He was his best friend all of those years. And after the 67 season was over, my mother told me it looked like your dad's going to have to find another job. That's how hot it was. They thought they were going to get fired. The doubters were really coming forth, and Coach Royal was being criticized. 67 season, I'll never forget, uh, we're coming after practice, and there was a blocking dummy hanging from an arch in the stadium, and it had Coach Royal written on it. So going into 68, there was a lot of pressure of we've got to fix things. He changed his staff and Emory Ballard had come in, and Emory was the offensive backfield coach. Ballard thought running a veer would be a good thing, so Emory took out his yellow pad, and he had his pipe, and he sequestered himself while the other coaches that summer were out playing golf. He was in his office doodling with that yellow pad. I walked into his office one day, and I said, so who's gonna start at wingback? Will it be Ted Coy, or will it be Steve Wooster? Emory said, what if we play both of them? So he took out his yellow pad and he drew a circle up here and a circle right up here. And he put a circle there and then a circle down here. And he said, Wooster, Gilbert, and Coy. He said, what does that look like? I said, it looks like a Y. And he said, I think it'll work. That was the beginning of the wishbone. My only question was, could we read the defensive tackle? We'd hit the fullback inside the defensive tackle, and you had to read him on the handoff. If he tackles the fullback when he put the ball in his stomach, I said, Emory, can we teach them to read the defensive tackle? He said, Dad, blame right we can. Oh, this is good chicken. I'm glad you like it. You know, Edith, I have an idea. We had the personnel that that offense was fitted for. He always said that he had three running backs that he needed to have on the field at one time, so he had to come up with a way for all three of them to be there. He was gifted with the guy that everyone then thought was going to be the greatest player in Texas history. Steve Wooster came from Blue City. He was an all-American high school player, was a rough, tough, burly fullback who could run with great speed and power. 
Everything was predicated by the fullback. The quarterback would start the play, but his first read was the fullback. So he was the linchpin. Steve Wooster is one of the best football players I ever played with. I never saw him take a slow step, whether we were ahead by 30 to nothing or the game was close. He'd come at you. As a matter of fact, we had a drill where Steve would kick out on the defensive end on a play, and we would run that drill in practice. He'd come out and hit me, and more often than not, we just went head to head like, like a couple of rams. And as a matter of fact, I've got a couple of broken helmets in my garage right now from those collisions. Steve brought a load when he came. It was a hell of an incentive to get out of the way. And when Steve hit you in the back, it hurt. A stalemate wasn't fun. So you wanted to go ahead and move because he was coming. It clicked. I mean, we had so much talent in that backfield, it was scary. I mean, everybody was somebody. And I don't mean that lightly. If you watch those films and you, and you see how they, when the ball snapped, the arc they take, the fakes they do, it's, it's almost like a ballet. It's unbelievable. With Wooster, Chris Gilbert, and Ted Coy tapped for the three running back positions, there was only one position in the backfield left to fill, quarterback. However, unseating the incumbent starter, Bill Bradley, seemed unlikely. Nicknamed Super Bill, he was the guy that everybody could count on to be able to do anything with the football. He could kick with both feet, throw with both hands. He was a god in football. Even on the diving board, he, he could probably be an Olympic diver. And he was the man. Bill Bradley was one of the best athletes I have ever seen in my life. He just struggled with the option. The question became, could Bill Bradley, who was the greatest player in Texas high school history at that point, as a quarterback, could he take over the duties of the wishbone and make it work? And they had two backups, a guy named Eddie Phillips, who was a larger runner. And then the other one was a guy who was one of nine quarterbacks that they'd recruited named James Street. Hailing from Longview, Texas, James Street was undersized and not highly recruited out of high school. He started 1968 far down the depth chart. First time I ever heard about the wishbone was when talking to Coach Bard and he set both uh, Bill Bradley and myself down. And after the first time I heard about it, I talked to Bradley, who at that time was the starting quarterback. And I said, Bill, I think that the coaches are trying to get rid of us. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, well, think about it, Bill. We're going to run an option to the right, and we're not going to block the defensive tackle or the defensive end. They're going to kill us. It fit my style of play. I was quick, and I could throw off of it. Coach Royal was great in building an offense or building a defense that complemented his players. And next time I just I just run I just run it away from split in. Okay. We got a piece of paper. I'll go carry. Okay, coach. We got got something to write on. Where, where, where's the glasses? Glasses, Bubba. You read the end man. You read the end man. This is what he's saying about uh, this is a basic formation that this guy has cheated up for our, our, our 52 bootlegs. See, he's backing in. We've got a player man out around here. That's counter. That is counter. I see this man's out here. He's got us man to man. We can run 88 out. Yes, sir. James Street was the most competitive player that I ever saw. He had a passion for winning. He was just cool. He exemplified the word cool. We all in those years kind of had short haircuts. He had kind of the Elvis Presley type haircut. In fact, picked up the name Slick early on. He would break out and comb his hair back like that, do that stuff right here. It's like having Elvis Presley as your quarterback. He got to be good pals with Elvis. Elvis would call him up in his dorm room. James met him. Uh, on several occasions, Elvis was fascinated with college football, and I remember James 
saying after one of the times he met backstage with Elvis, James said he was wanting to talk to Elvis about his music and his songs, and Elvis was wanting to talk to James about the football. So he said they were kind of both kind of talking on top of each other, wanting to know about the other person. Coach Roll had that term, it. James had it. That's all you can say. There were better quarterbacks than James. James didn't play in the NFL. He wasn't the best passer around. He probably wasn't the fastest, but he had it. He was a winner. And under Street, they won. After starting the 1968 season with a tie and a loss, Slick took over as the starting quarterback in the third game. The Longhorns would go on to win the next nine games, ending the season with a 36-13 victory over eighth-ranked Tennessee in the Cotton Bowl. Under the guidance of Street, Texas racked up 331 rushing yards a game in 1968. The wishbone was clicking. We felt like that they could announce the play over the PA system. We didn't care. We were gonna be able to run it anyway. It was an ungodly offense. I mean, nobody had anything like it, and nobody knew how to defense it. It was captivating. It dominated. Nobody could stop it. They just killed everybody that they played. At the end of 68, Texas was as good as any team in the country, and everybody knew it. Nobody could stop the wishbone. One year after Coach Royal was on the hot seat, Texas entered the 1969 season, ranked number four in the nation, behind Penn State, Arkansas, and Ohio State. The expectations were very high for 1969. We weren't really in control of our own destiny at that point. Ohio State was the top team. They'd won the national championship the year before, and they had everybody back. We would like to be the best team in this nation. There's been talk about ours being the best team of the century, and I'm not going to hold our kids back. We thought we were playing for second place anyway, but we still wanted to win every game and win the conference championship and go to the Cotton Bowl. That's all we can do. We just figured that they gave it to them because they had more northern sports writers than they, than they, than they did in the south. <laughs> we didn't think it was the case, so we just thought we'd go prove it. Coming up on 1969. They came out on the first play and lined up in the wishbone. They think they're going to beat us running the wishbone. <laughs> it's hard to imagine today how big of an event it was. Not only for ourselves and our coaches and our university, but for our fans. We weren't gonna let people down. I think that's part of why that game was just magical. That's one of those moments that we are destined to win this thing. We didn't make up the plaque in advance. It doesn't say what team, and I'm taking it back to Washington and put in Texas. <laughs> To live up to their lofty preseason ranking, the Longhorns needed the wishbone to work. And for the wishbone to work, the offensive line needed to be in sync. Fortunately, Texas had two All-Americans leading the way, and Bob McKay and Bobby Wunsch. Bobby Wunsch, the person, is one of the sweetest guys you'd ever want to meet. But when he stepped on that football field, it was just a personality change. <laughs> It'd be Jekyll and Hyde. When he was on the football field, he was a whirling dervish, and uh, you, you would never even think that he played football. He just talked to him. You would think that, you know, maybe he was a poet or something. It would be illegal to have 21, 22 players like Bobby Wunsch on the field at the same time. The NCAA would come up with a rule. That's an honor. It makes me feel respected. They tried to uh, mow people over. I didn't, never played chicken. I'd go right at them, and I'd look them right in the eye. Once in the Longhorns offense, steamrolled through the first three games of the season, outscoring their opponents 122 to 24. With the wishbone in full swing, they prepared to face their first ranked opponent of the year, the number eight Oklahoma Sooners. Oklahoma was not gonna roll over and play dead because we've got a new offense. The OU game, of course, is always circled on our schedule. It's, it's kind of like if there's going to be a fly in the ointment, this could be it. It's Oklahoma. There's not another mindset. 
If you walk down that tunnel and walk out there on that field and you're not fired up, you better go find you something else to do because you're going to get your ass kicked. We are proud to be on hand for the annual battle between the football teams of the universities of Texas and Oklahoma here on the Cotton Bowl. 72,000 plus watching as Nelson takes the on. There he goes all alone. Three minutes, 39 seconds remaining in the first quarter. Oklahoma leads 7 to nothing. They have the ball. And Owens gets his eighth touchdown of the year. And it's 13 to nothing. Underdog Oklahoma. One of three games when we were went, went behind significantly. And everybody just kept plugging away. I mean, we didn't hang our heads or anything. Third and 11. Street gets some pass blocking. Out there all alone. Touchdown, Spire. Texas has moved from its own 42 in four plays. Touchdown. First and goal. Texas now trying to cap an 80-yard drive. Brittleson, touchdown. Well, we have a tie ball game. That's a momentum game. A, a team that's down doesn't mean they're out. A team that's up doesn't mean they're going to stay up. So we, we had the confidence. We just knew the game wasn't over, and we still had a chance. And so we just kind of kept working. Second and goal. Worcester getting in for the TD. Putting the Longhorns ahead, 26 to 17. What a rivalry. And there it is. A 27 to 17 victory for the favored Longhorns of the University of Texas. Texas continued to ravage defenses for the next four games. Its smallest margin of victory over that span was 31 points. Against SMU, Texas rushed for 611 yards, a school record that still stands. But the Longhorns couldn't climb to the number one ranking, not while reigning champion Ohio State was still undefeated. Honestly, we think that we can win it all. I, I would say that there have been times we probably had the conversation, wish we could play Ohio State, wish we could play Ohio State. Undefeated and ranked second in the nation, Texas headed into its bye week with only one game before the showdown with Arkansas. The Longhorns needed help to overtake the Buckeyes in the rankings. Nobody thought they could be beaten. Michigan had just hired a new young coach named Bo Schembechler, and nobody gave them any chance at all of beating Ohio State. It appeared that they were destined to go back to back. The Michigan Stadium at Ann Arbor, Michigan, where the Wolverines meet the nation's number one college football team, the Buckeyes of Ohio State University, in a battle that will decide the Big Ten Championship. Third and goal to go on the one. Otis, touchdown for Ohio State. Ohio State was so heavily favored over Michigan, it wasn't even worth watching. Back in those days, there was no community television or anything, but some guys had a little portable unit with a, the rabbit ears and everything, so there were several rooms that had a little TV, and we were, we were watching, of course. Crawl, somersaults into the end zone. It's a touchdown for Michigan, and the Wolverines take the lead. In motion is Doughty. Kept the ball is Moorhead, and he's in the end zone for a touchdown. Isajowski back. Heads for the sidelines, fumbles the ball, it's picked up by Michigan. And there it is, what has to be the upset of the century. I still remember driving down Cameron Road where I grew up and hearing that Michigan had beat Ohio State. I couldn't believe it, I couldn't believe it. It was one of the best days of my life. People just went completely bananas. I mean, people down on the drag, they were, I mean, it was unreal. When it was over, it was, it was battling in the dorm. That we had a chance now for everything to pay off. All of a sudden, now you wake up Monday morning and you're number one. That's what you dream of, you're number one. I remember walking across campus and thinking, this is pretty neat because the University of Texas is the number one team. This team has put this university number one in the nation. It's funny, I, I always felt like we were number one, so yeah, it didn't change. I just felt like we were the best team in college football that year. The Longhorns' first opponent as the top team in the nation was rival Texas A&M. I saw too many times that supposedly the best team was being pushed around. So we drive into College Station, and I'm one of the captains, and I'm worried. I'm absolutely worried. And so we were at the part of pregame warm-ups where we were 
had come together for teamwork. And I'll never forget this. The a and band marches into the stadium and they strike up the Aggie War Hymn. And there was an electric look in all of our players' eyes. I knew at that point, this is our game. The first play of the game, a has got the football. And when they're coming out of the huddle, it looks strange. And then it, it's like a puzzle. All of a sudden, before they even got to the line of scrimmage, I knew what they were doing. Because I'd seen it so many times, they came out on the first play and lined up in the wishbone. They think they're gonna beat us running the wishbone. <laughs> And it was, it was pathetic. They didn't have a chance. Tom Campbell intercepts Rocky South's pants and takes it back to the Aggie Four yard line. Took us out in the second quarter. We'd scored the first six times we had the ball and weren't happy about having to come out. Coach said that the second team lettered before the first team that year. Uh, you had to play so many quarters and they were playing more quarters than we were. We have talked about that game and with total confidence we could have put over 100 points on the board. No question asked. Myrtleson makes the score 33 to nothing as Ted Coy wipes out the last Aggie defender. I scored my only touchdown of my career on a pass from Cotton Spire of all people. That was the day I got engaged that night. It was after the game at the Fountain Down Duty that I proposed to my soon to be wife. So it was a great day for me. With the victory against the Aggies, Texas remained undefeated on the season. As celebrations ensued for the football team, the 40 Acres, Austin, and the nation as a whole were in a state of unrest over U.S. involvement in the Vietnam War. The country, I say, was in turmoil, but it was mainly the younger generation. It was, it was new to us because the kids my age in college, we'd never been through a war. When you walked across campus, you couldn't help. They'd be picketing everywhere. If you're sitting there watching TV and there's a 20, 30 black bags laid out in a row, and you got weapons with their bayonets stuck in the ground and the headgear sitting on top of them, and there's a transport plane in the background back there walking out with a wooden casket and placing the body by again to the wooden casket. How would you feel? They're showing death on TV. They're showing you the number of kill count. And these things were all emotional. And it changed the, the nation. It changed the way you felt. Why were we doing this? Why were so many men dying? You always fear of death. Uh, I'm a young man, uh, I want to raise a family, I want to live life. But then again, you are called to serve your country, and if you got to serve your country, you serve your country. On December 1st, four days after the Texas A&M game, players gathered around TVs to watch as the Selective Service Draft Lottery decided the fate of young men across the nation. If you were lucky, you might have a very high number and you likely wouldn't get called. If you had a low number, you might be called soon. If you were in school and a student and, and you were in good graces in your school, you wouldn't be called. But those who were seniors knew that their future may be determined by what happened with the draft. September 14th. September 14, zero. Zero, one. To tell you the truth, it scared me. Uh, we didn't want to go to Vietnam and fight over there. You draw a little ball out there, like bingo, B1. <laughs> and then if that group was needed, they'd say, we'll take all the lottery from this number to that number right here and y'all come in and take your physical and you, then you became the next ones out. Mike and I had a fairly low number meaning you know we would get drafted. My number was very low I think I had a nine or a ten I was yeah I was definitely going to be drafted uh, when that was over. It's the only lottery I've ever won in my life. 
December 27th. December 27th is 078. House number 78. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I had uh, <laughs> everybody sitting around watching and you're, you're rooting for the worst number in the world and you'll get picked. It's not that I gave it a whole lot of thought at the time, but it's really main, mainly afterwards when I knew that some of my friends had been drafted. Uh, you know, because not many people were volunteering, not, not like after Pearl Harbor when I heard that kids came down out of stands to, to join. It was a difficult time, and, uh, you know, I, 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 I just, uh, it's hard to talk about because, you know, you, everybody's lost, my age has uh, lost friends over there. There were people getting killed, and uh, that's a tough deal to deal with, especially with Bobby and his brother. Bobby Mitchell's brother had been killed in Vietnam earlier that year. When the draft lottery of 1969 came about, we were in the dorm room watching the TV. And um, of course, it, it was very traumatic for me, having lost a brother who uh, was a helicopter pilot and was killed in action. When I found out, I walked out on campus and by myself and of course was crying and upset and I, I um I don't I, I don't know I, I think uh, after that Freddie found me and he was my roommate and uh, we said some prayers and uh, and that that made me feel a little bit better Freddie Steinmark became Mitchell's family while he was at UT the two came to Austin together from Wheat Ridge Colorado and if it weren't for Mitchell's desire to play college football somewhere warm, Steinmark would never have stepped foot on the 40 acres. I went to my coach and I said, you know, I really love the University of Texas, but I haven't heard anything from them. And he said, well, they don't recruit out of state. And I said, well, can we just give it a go? And he said, okay, well, I know somehow he was a friend of a friend of Coach Campbell's, who was our defensive coach at Texas. And he said, well, all right, I'll send, I'll send the game films down there. So they, they watched the game films and they said, okay, Bob, we're definitely interested in you. We want, we want you to come down and visit. And Coach Coates, who was our high school coach, said, well, by the way, they saw the game film, and they saw, saw Freddie on there. And Coach Coates told him, they said, well, you know, he's one of our best players uh, also, but he's only 5'9", 160 pounds, and, you know, he hadn't gotten any other offers. And he said, well, we don't care. Bring him down anyway. I remember showing him around, and in those days, you showed the recruit around, and then on the designated time, you took him by to talk to Coach Royal. So I was waiting outside Coach Royal's office, and so when Freddie came out, you know, how'd, how'd it go? And Freddie says, great. And I said, oh, well, that's good. And he says, yeah. He said, Coach Royal never mentioned my size. And he says he's the only coach that didn't mention my size. He just said I'd have a chance to play. And that's when I realized Here's a, here's a, quite frankly, a little kid that has a, an enormous spirit and confidence that he can do the job. So that's when I realized he's a little bit different. His size didn't prohibit him from doing anything he needed to do. And uh, tackling people or making blocks or carrying the football on turn. He was just a great contributor to the team. and to our morale. What he really meant to the three defensive backs, to the, at least me and Danny, he was our leader and, and he was just so confident. I knew if I made a mistake, Freddie was going to cover for me. If I let someone get behind me somehow or other, Freddie was going to be there to make up for my mistake. Freddie meant a lot because he had, first of all, overcome a lot of obstacles. Uh, a lot of people told him he couldn't play Division I college football because he was too small. He didn't believe it. He was an incredible player. And one of the reasons we were the team that we were. Steinmark and the Longhorns were preparing for one of the biggest games in college football history, a matchup with number two Arkansas that would decide the 1969 national champion. 
I think that game took on a special meaning for a, a lot of people. It was the only game being played that day. And our country, I think, needed something okay. You know, they needed something, and football was an American uh, pastime, and our country really needed something like that. So I think that is why that game took on a life of its own. Coming up on 1969. You couldn't set up a ball game to be better than this. I mean, if you're writing the script for it. I'd never been to Fayetteville. That's what the coaches kept telling us, that Fayetteville's unlike anywhere else you've ever been. My dad said, playing in Arkansas is like parachuting into Russia. We were told to keep our helmets on at all times, and uh, you know, and it's kind of like, what? They're gonna throw whiskey on you and it's still in the bottle. So, uh, yeah, okay, good, good idea, keep your helmet on. <laughs> all the media thought that Texas was just gonna crush Arkansas and it didn't happen that way. I said, Coach, are you sure that's a play you want to run? And he said, hell yeah, I'm sure. We all went, what? <laughs> you know, he said, we're going to throw the freaking ball? You got to be kidding me. He had already thrown it. I thought, it's way over my head. I'll never catch it. You go from one of the highest times in your life to all of a sudden, here's one of your teammates that's fighting for his life. The game of the century was not only a showdown between the top two teams in the nation, but one between fierce conference rivals. Combined, Texas and Arkansas won all but two Southwest Conference championships in the 1960s. Frank Burroughs at Arkansas and Darrell Royal at Texas basically dominated. The real beauty of the Texas-Arkansas football series was that Darrell and Frank were best friends. They and their wives went on vacations together. They played each other, so they, they weren't going to talk about football. They loved to play golf together. They were best friends. He thinks I'm better, and I think he's better, so that makes it a heck of a match. <laughs> it's hard to imagine today how big of an event it was. Because Beano Cook at ABC had had the foresight to move that game, and Daryl and Frank agreed to do it, they had set up a showcase that was unlike any other. There was no playoff. There was no BCS. So when that ball game was dropped into the mix out of the clear blue sky, suddenly they had a national championship game. It was validated because the President of the United States shows up with a plaque to present to the winner of that game. And he says, I'm proclaiming the national championship, which really didn't sit well with the folks in Pennsylvania. As anyone who's ever sipped a glass of beer in the corner pub can tell you, the quickest way to pick an argument is to pick the nation's number one college football team. Well, the White House has jumped squarely into this annual, unresolvable dispute. Tomorrow, the president plans to present a plaque to the winner of the Texas-Arkansas game, designating that team as the nation's number one. Not so, say Penn State fans. It seemed easy. He could come to the Texas-Arkansas game, he could present a plaque to the winner of that game, except there's Penn State hanging out over here. And Joe Paterno and his crowd, they think they ought to be in that mix. So they're wondering why Nixon is there giving the plaque to either Arkansas or Texas. Penn State, also undefeated, had already accepted a bid to play in the Orange Bowl earlier in the season. By choosing the Orange Bowl before Ohio State lost, Penn State passed up the chance to play either Texas or Arkansas in the Cotton Bowl, setting up the game of the century, which would determine the national champion. You couldn't set up a ball game to be better than this. I mean, if you're writing the script for it. The media attention to that game was incredible. You had all the sports writers from all the major papers. You had the New York Times, the Chicago Tribune. All of those people had writers who would come to Austin. We were getting into something very, very big. If we, as 18, 19, 20, 21 year old kids, would have understood the magnitude of that game, we would have probably been injured by the thoughts of how big that was. And then you had the general support. And, you know, that can be 
summarized by the pep rally before the game was attended by something like 35, 40,000 people. You look over there and the entire side of the stadium is full. You're going, my God. They were wired and inspired. It was unbelievable. I mean, it really got us moving. It just showed us that we had so many people behind us. And it just made us more determined that not only for ourselves and our coaches and our university, but for our fans, we weren't going to let people down. Bill is the game of the decade, Arkansas against Texas. It's doubtful any previous football game attracted so much undivided attention since it was the only game played December 6, 1969. The site, Razorback Stadium in Fayetteville. I'd never been to Fayetteville. That's what the coaches kept telling us at Fayetteville. Unlike anywhere else you've ever been. <laughs> you felt like you was going from civilization to another world. And it was another world. My dad said, playing in Arkansas is like parachuting into Russia. It was a pretty hectic week for Fayetteville, Arkansas. You could tell something big was going on. It started out when we got off the airplane. We had flown into Rogers uh, at a, a, some distance away from Fayetteville. We thought it would be safer. Well, somehow somebody found us and, and spread the word. They came down out of the hills. Some of them, it's like they'd never seen pavement before. Their goal was to try to keep us up all night. They were calling our rooms and trying to keep us from going to sleep at night, uh, making noise outside. They didn't like us. So they did cheers outside practically all night long. We couldn't sleep real well, which we didn't. Then when we were on the bus, when we went through Fayetteville, it, it wasn't just a little shoe polish on the windows. I mean, it was red spray paint on the sides of buildings, sidewalks, everywhere. Everywhere we went, all the businesses were closed down. All of them had anti-longhorn signs on them. I remember going by a drive-in. It had a big sign, it had little barricades. It said, closed, gone to Texas funeral. And I thought, that's not just a little clever sign. That's the intensity of the environment we are in, that this is big, this is big. We are told to keep our helmets on at all times, and uh, you know, it's kind of like, what? They're gonna throw whiskey on you and it's still in the bottle. So, uh, you know, okay, good, good idea, keep your helmet on. <laughs> As a crowd gathered around the stadium, another contingent formed at Fort Smith to greet President Nixon. All that I know is that we're going to see today the, in this 100th anniversary of football, one of the great football games of all time. College football celebrates its centennial year. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the game of the year. This is the home of the Razorbacks in the heartland of America, the foothills of the Ozark Mountains. A standing room only crowd of 44,000 are here as the nation's number one team, the Longhorns from the University of Texas, are ready to defend their lofty ranking against the number two team in the nation, the Razorbacks of Arkansas. We're awaiting the arrival of a very ardent football fan here in Arkansas, our Commander-in-Chief, President Nixon. As the game began, all the media thought that Texas was just gonna crush Arkansas, and uh, it didn't happen that way. The wishbone team in the backfield. Arkansas has recovered. Fumbles, fumbles, fumbles. We just couldn't hold on to the football. Here's the first Texas pass. Not inspired. And Arkansas intercepts. A fumble recovery and now an interception on the very first Longhorn pass. We'd never had turnovers like this. It gives the momentum to them, to their crowd, and as close as they were to you, they let you know about it. Everything was going wrong, we were confused. I was confused because they changed the defense. Yeah. The University of Arkansas was the number one defense in the country, 
especially at the rush. Well, we had studied all week before the big shootout exactly what they were doing, but what the problem was, they were lining up slightly different than they'd ever done before, so we really didn't know who to block half the time, so we were so frustrated. They had come up with a defense that we couldn't beat. We threw the football. We didn't throw the football. <laughs> we didn't do that. We never played in a game where a team forced us to throw the ball and not run our wishbone. Our defense probably played a big role there by creating some uh, turnovers early in the game that, that uh, created some momentum for us. Back and a goal and Arkansas lead, Bill Burnett. The score is underdog Arkansas, seven, Texas, nothing. We scored the first time we had the ball, and the second time down the field, we scored again. Back live from the 26 of Texas, first down, Arkansas. He's all alone! Touchdown, Chuck Blakers! But we had a penalty. A marker is down, a penalty flag. On the play, no touchdown. That is a bad break for Arkansas. The biggest play of the game was really this getting this overturned. He's actually in the end zone celebrating. I'm looking down there and I see a referee looking back at, at me, looking right at me. And we'd been told don't ever say anything to the referee. It's almost like he's asking if I'm gonna come say something. And so I literally pointed to Reese and I said, ref, he's blocking on me when the ball is in the air and that's a penalty. And the ref says, you're right and takes, reaches around, takes the flag out of his pocket and throws it on the ground. And they called the whole thing back. Taking seven points off the board is critical. Despite three first half turnovers, the Longhorns were only down seven to nothing entering halftime. We were down, but we were still confident. We knew that the next play was potentially the one we needed. We were behind and we knew it, but the game still had time on the clock. This game is not done yet. The score here at Razorback Stadium in Fayetteville, Arkansas. The Razorbacks seven, the Longhorns nothing. Looking at this game, it is for the ranking of number one, incidentally. I say it is for that, having in mind the fact that Penn State's been giving me a lot of flack this week for coming down here. Maybe we ought to have a super college bowl after this, but whatever the case might be. Looking at these two teams today, uh, either one is going to be number one and by the vote of the writers. But what is more important is the tremendous spirit that they generate. It's good for people to be for somebody, to be for a team. And uh, you can learn a lot uh, from losing as well as winning. I've had a little experience of that. You've watched football for years. Could you uh, just predict maybe what might uh, transpire in the second half? As I look at this game in the first half, I think that Texas has enormous power that is really not unleashed yet. Uh, and that in the second half, uh, they are likely to be much better offensively. Uh, however, they're not going to run over Arkansas. They can't do it by just going that three yards in a cloud of dust. Uh, the old Woody Hayes formula, not the Woody Hayes formula this year. I think they're going to have to throw more. They have an excellent passer. They're going to have to throw to open up the Arkansas defense. I think under those circumstances, they're likely to score once or twice. I expect both teams to score in the second half. The question is whether Texas's superior manpower, and I mean probably a stronger bench, may win in the last quarter. That's the way I see it. Trailing by just seven, Texas continued to struggle finding a rhythm on offense in the second half. 25, 30, coming outside. Gets away again. There is a loose ball. Arkansas has come up with it. And the cut fire is losing the ball. It's still loose. And Arkansas comes up with its third fumble recovery. He's going deep. It's floating out there. And another error by the Longhorn. We were starting to feel like Golly, you know, are we going to be able to pull this out or not? Montgomery. Dykus. Touchdown. 
into the third quarter here at Razorback Stadium in Fayetteville, Arkansas, the score. The Razorbacks 14, Texas nothing. As the third quarter ended, I remember thinking, we're down by 14 points, we better score fast. This is the first time going into the fourth quarter that we're down. It's kind of slipping away from you. You're running out of time to win the ball game. On the first play of the fourth quarter, Texas got a spark. We had called uh, just a little crossing pattern to Randy Peschel uh, crossing across the middle, and, and Bob McKay, being an All-American tackle, missed his block. Start of the fourth quarter, Jimmy Street in trouble. Oh, hell, I missed a block on, a, on my defensive end. I told everybody I missed it on purpose because I couldn't let Street throw another interception. Gets away. There he goes. And Texas is on the scoreboard. 42 yards. And then came the pivotal decision of the whole ball game and probably of Darrell Royal's career. So on the bus on the way to the game, Darrell called James Street up to the front of the bus. And he said, James, if we run a, uh, if we run a two-point play, this is the play we're gonna run. I said, oh heck, coach, we're not gonna need a two-point play. Darrell made the commitment that if we were down by two touchdowns, that we would go for the two-point conversion first. When we decided we were going for two, I said, we're not here to tie this game. And now they are going for two. And Street. What a heads up play by Jimmy Street. He has just made eight points for the nation's number one team. 14 minutes, 47 seconds remaining. With the Longhorns now within striking distance of Arkansas, they needed a stop on defense to get the ball back. We couldn't let Arkansas score any more points. Morrison out on a batter. And it's Dykus. And here's that third down pass. Down the middle. And it was complete to Dykus. Lofting one to Dykus, and a marker is down in the secondary. In the ensuing drive, Freddie Steinmark, who was Texas safety, had reached out on the play and basically tackled Chuck Dykus, who was Arkansas's lead receiver. If he catches that pass and goes in the end zone, it's a touchdown, game's over. It's just an unbelievably brilliant move. It should have just been an easy touchdown, the game's over. Now it's the penalty, we're walking back, we get in the defensive huddle. I was thinking they were gonna try to kick a field goal to kind of ice it. The most important play or the most important decision, we had driven the ball all the way back down the field and gotten to the Texas six, where a field goal would have made the score 17 to eight. We opted for a very safe sprint out pass, uh, which didn't turn out to be so safe. And Texas gets an interception. What an interception, Danny Lester, number 23. The interception clearly in the fourth quarter was the, the biggest disappointment. That was the play that really made it come home that we we're gonna win. When that happened, everybody on the sideline knew that no matter what, if it's fourth and 15, we're gonna go for it and we're gonna make it. We didn't feel like anything was gonna stop us. Texas had a chance and they got out to the 43 yard line. And then it was fourth and three. With a fourth down coming up in this Southwest Conference battle, 447 to go, Arkansas leading 14 to eight. Her face certainly reflecting the team she's rooting for, Texas. We call timeout, James goes to the sideline. All three of us are on the phone, Coach Royal, myself, and Emory Blard. And we're all talking. Uh, to each other, and, and Coach Blard and myself wanted to run a counter option back in the short side of the field. Out of nowhere, and I don't know where he got it, and I don't even know where he thought of the play. Coach Royal says, right, 53 veer pass. I remember talking to our tight end, Randy Peschel, at halftime, and he said the halfback was paying no attention to him when he would release and go downfield. 
So we thought we had a chance to slip that receiver in behind their defensive halfback. Every time we'd run the veer, their halfback that I was supposed to block, he would commit so fast to the run that I had a hard time blocking. And I knew or felt I could get behind him. Coach Campbell's standing there, and the first thing Coach Campbell does is he jumps up and hollers, defense, get ready. Defense, get ready. I, you know, I think he's seen me pass. I said, Coach, are you sure that's a play you want to run? He said, hell yeah, I'm sure. And so I go back into the field, and the first thing I did when I got in the huddle is I told the guys the truth. I said, y'all not going to believe this play. We all went, what? <laughs> he said, we're going to throw the freaking ball? You're going to be kidding me. <laughs> Trust me, we were surprised. It wasn't exactly our go-to play. I don't know we'd ever run it before. I don't know that they'd ever been called. A most crucial fourth down play again for the Longhorns. Everybody says when an accident is happening, it happens to you in slow motion. That's kind of the way that pass was. It just seemed slow motion. I drop back to throw the ball. Peschel's looks like he's open. I throw the ball. I turned around and looked. He had already thrown it. And I thought, it's way over my head. I'll never catch it. And going for broke to Randy Peschel. And Peschel catches the ball. What a toss. Randy Peschel. Arkansas, 13, first down. I remember hands coming up to block it, and they were like this. And the ball went over and cleared them about six inches. That's all. Came right into my hand. Perfect pass. I remember seeing a cheerleader of ours doing cartwheels on the field, and I thought, Hey, we got a first down. Man, it's like opening a box of Cracker Jacks. You have no idea what you're going to find inside sometimes. That was a perfect throw and a great catch. And it took exactly that. There were six hands up in the air. Only two of them belonged to Texas. Four of them belonged to Arkansas. Remarkable doesn't even begin to describe it. I call it an intervention by the creator. I think as God said, we want Texas to win this football game. I think that's part of why that game was just magical. That's one of those moments that we are destined to win this thing. First and goal. Touchdown, Longhorn. 14 to 14 for the point after, or two coming up. 64 yards, six plays. This is a big one. It's up. Yeah. Texas for the first time with three minutes and 58 seconds left in the game. They have the lead by one. They have 358 on the clock. Arkansas has plenty of time with the type of offense that they have. I looked at it and saw that there was four minutes to go in the game. And I thought, holy cow. I mean, that's an eternity. From the 30. Second and nine. And Burnett catches his second pass of the afternoon. And the Razorbacks are in Texas territory with a first down at the Texas 46, a minute and 51 to go. All of a sudden, now they're looking at a pass that, if it is caught, actually puts Bill McClard, that great field goal kicker, in range. Now with a second and three, a minute 22 to go. Here is Bill Montgomery. Trying to get Reese. Texas has come up with the big play. And very fitting, Tom Campbell. When Reese put his left foot down and made that cut to the outside, my left foot hit the ground at the exact same time his did. And that's why I had leverage on the football. All four hands were on it, but I had a stronger position and yanked it right out of his hand. So there it is. Jubilant Longhorn. 
from Austin, Texas. And the eyes of Texas will undoubtedly be heard very, very soon on the far side of the field. This is a song written in 1903 by John Lang Sinclair. Let's listen. We go into the locker room, and I think it was gradually wearing onto each of us as individuals that we are now the national champion. Here in the dressing room, as you can see, it is absolute madness. Four horns have come on in, raising their hands, number one, hook and board. It was crazy. Even Coach Wall, which I've never seen him so animated in my life, but he was hugging players. Gives me a big hug and a kiss on the cheek. I never thought that would happen. When you get to the dressing room, no one can come in the dressing room except for the team, the players, and the entourage with the president. Because President Nixon is coming to give the plaque to the winners. How do you feel? All right. I'm I've got to be the happiest guy in America tonight. Yeah. Presenting this plaque, I, I want to say first that the, the AP and the UPI will name Texas number one, as we know, uh, after this game. And uh, this is a great honor in the 100th year of football. I also want to say that having seen this game, what convinced me that Texas deserves that is the fact that you want a tough one for a team to be behind 14 to nothing, and then not to lose its cool and to go on to win. That proves you deserve to be number one, and that's what you are. I, I want all of you to know that we didn't make up the plaque in advance. It doesn't say what team, and I'm taking it back to Washington, put in Texas. The plaque that Nixon presented to Texas, no one has seen that plaque in a long time. The Nixon plaque is a mystery. To my knowledge, we don't know where it is. It's probably in the Watergate tapes or something. <laughs> probably a, a disgruntled Penn State fan. It's at the bottom of a Lake Erie or somewhere like that. <laughs> I have it. It's back here. <laughs> Street took it with me. <laughs> I don't know how that's the first I'd ever heard of that. There's no telling. But I'd blame it on James. We leave the stadium, go out to the airport, get on the airplane, and people are going uh, crazy on the airplane still. We, we're, I'm talking on the loudspeaker, and we're, we're I mean, everybody's having fun, and, and uh, then we fly into Austin, and as we fly into Austin, I, they let me sit up in the cockpit of the, the plane and watch us come in and land. But what was amazing is the number of people that were at the airport. In those days, you didn't have the security at the airport like you have today, and when we got back home, there were 10,000 people on the runway. They had gotten through the airport and then just come out to meet the team. It was, I guess, like a rock concert or something that you'd see later on, you know, with the Beatles or somebody. These, these people just broke through these barriers and we're watching them and the pilots are afraid because they're running, just storming toward us. The fans were trying to come up inside the plane. The next thing we know, they've almost torn it off. Austin came out to to meet us that day, that was fantastic. People are going crazy, I mean, down on the drag, you couldn't drive, but people swinging from the, the lights over to Guadalupe. They said immediately after the game, the, the, the drag filled up with people, including policemen. And they, they said the policemen were drinking beer with, the, with, the, with everybody else, but it, everybody was just partying. It was, it was celebration time. Following the national championship, the public could not get enough of the Longhorn players and coaches. They were stars, with some of the team even flying out to New York City for media appearances. 
Steve and I went to New York. I were on the Bob Hope special. Bob McKay, University of Texas. There you have him, folks. Six foot six and 250 pounds. Thank you, mother. <laughs> He's the kind of a player who even makes the timeouts dangerous. He once swallowed the water boy. <laughs> and now the shifty cats, the guys with more moves than a belly dancer with the hives, the running backs. Steve Wooster, University of Texas. I mean, being backstage, I'm just going, wow, I'm from Bridge City, you know. <laughs> Here I am in New York, and I'm backstage with Bob Hope out there, you know, and he's performing. It was amazing. It's just that surreal feeling of being on top of the mountain. You go from one of the highest times in your life to all of a sudden, here's one of your teammates that's fighting for his life. The celebration would come to a sudden halt, only days after the national championship win. Three days after the victory over Arkansas, Dale Royal and his three captains were in New York to receive the MacArthur Bowl trophy. We're national champions. The three captains went up and we were at a reception and Coach Royal called the three captains together in a little side room and that's when he told us. Coach, he was very businesslike. He didn't use a whole lot of words. It's really simple. I'm depending on you to represent our school. And at the same time, guys, this is a crucial situation or I wouldn't be leaving you to go down there. But I think I need to be by Freddie. Hours earlier, back in Austin, junior safety Freddie Steinmark learned he had a tumor on his left thigh bone. There we were in the midst of being applauded as members of the national championship team to being told that a part of your national championship team has cancer. So in the course of a couple of days, you go from an indescribable high to an indescribable low. I was talking on the phone to Dr. Joe Renault, who was our team doctor. And uh, I could tell he was down and he said, Freddie has bone cancer. And I didn't know whether you meant Fred Akers, the assistant coach, or Steinmark. I couldn't imagine Steinmark. This is a vivacious young kid who's got his entire life in front of him. And I said, my God, can you save him? And Joe said, I don't think so. It was just so startling, so shocking. I'd never even heard of cancer. And to hear Coach Rural say, Freddie's in the fight for his life. There's no way to prepare yourself for something like that. It was like, is this for real or is this a dream? Or, you know, it, 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 was, it was just so shocking and we were totally unprepared for it. All of a sudden, here's one of your teammates that's fighting for his life. And one of the nicest kids you'd ever, ever want to know. He was absolutely a prince among princes. It was just a disaster. I mean, it was just, we, we couldn't figure it out. And uh, I can remember us, two or three of us gathering in, in my room and just talking and not being, you know, just not understanding. And I said, you know, I believe in God, but I just don't understand what God's doing. Why would he do this to him? Very few people even knew how much pain he was really in. I did because I saw him rubbing and, and aching and, and rubbing it at night, and, and that's when it bothered him the most. They took him to Houston, to MD Anderson, which was the best cancer hospital in the world at that time. And they told Freddie when he went into the surgery, he said, if it is malignant, they're going to amputate his leg. It was really a tough, tough thing going in to see Freddie because he, he was a tough little guy and he was sitting with his legs crossed up in the bed in the pajamas. And just he and I were in the room. And he said, Coach, he's looking right at me, just, I mean, hard looking at me. He said, they, they don't tell me much. He said, I know they've told you and I know you won't lie to me. I said, what is it? I 
And I said, well, Freddie, it's, uh, we've been in some tough spots together and, and I refuse to, to have the final answer or final opinion and the doctors do too until we get the biopsy. So I figured if the doctors didn't tell him that I shouldn't. When the surgery was over, we heard his mother scream, you know, uh, out loud when obviously it was bad news that they had, in fact, amputated his leg. Scott Henderson and I went to go visit uh, Freddie at the hospital after, the, after he had his leg amputated. And I have a picture of him with the four of us. And Freddie has got the biggest smile out of the four of us. That's the kind of spirit that kid had. It made us more committed to winning one for Freddie. We were doing it for Freddie. It was Freddie's game. It really takes your mind off of the preparation that was really needed to face a first-class team like Notre Dame. The ninth-ranked Fighting Irish had accepted a bid to play Texas in the Cotton Bowl. It was Notre Dame's first postseason appearance since the 1925 Rose Bowl. The Cotton Bowl were able to work with the Notre Dame administration, and for the first time since the days of the Four Horsemen, Notre Dame came to a bowl game. That was big news. That was a big deal. All of my football life up to that point, Notre Dame, Notre Dame, Notre Dame, you know, they were famous. They had giants on their team. I thought we had big guys when they were 250. Oh my God, those were the little guys on Notre Dame's team. They were bigger than we were at every position, including quarterback. Joe Theismann was a lot bigger than James Street. Notre Dame had a defensive tackle by the name of Mike McCoy, an All-American. At that time, I think Mike was like a 300-pound player, which was unusual back then. I mean, uh, most of the tackles were 220, 225, or smaller. The first time we ever saw the Notre Dame players, they were having a Cotton Bowl luncheon. We were already seated, and the Notre Dame team walked in. They were all in uniform. They all had identical blazers, and they were sharp, and they were big. And they walked in. They looked like the Green Bay Packers. And I start looking at our team with new eyes, and all I just see is a bunch of little skinny guys. And we're all mismatched clothes. Notre Dame motivated us more than they helped themselves. And they were talkers, and they bragged. We got the implication they were blessing us to come down and allow us to be exposed to them. They were going to enlighten us that we were now the number one team in the nation, that they got the opportunity to be beaten by the true number one team in the nation. And so that was infuriating to a bunch of Texas kids that were good to stand on their own two feet. If we wanted to whip their ass bad, they just didn't think it was possible, a little rinky dink Texas team could beat them. They didn't put us on their level. With the Cotton Bowl scheduled to kick off January 1st, preparations and game plans were set. One thing that was unclear, though, was if Freddie Steinmark would make it to the game. But he only had three weeks from the surgery till the game. He wanted to be there on that sideline that day. And the doctors told him that he couldn't do it. He wouldn't be able to do it, but they didn't know Freddie Steinmark. Freddie comes into the locker room and we all see him and you couldn't help but knowing Freddie and knowing what he has had to go through to get himself here to this game. It's hard to figure how you can get 75,000 people to be quiet and cry. But somehow when Freddie Steinmark came on his crutches down the ramp of the cotton mill, it was a scene like nothing else was there.
suddenly there is this lone figure on his crutches with his pant leg tucked up and his long coat on coming down the ramp. How in the hell could he do that? I mean, it just astounded me. And the pain, I don't care how strong he was or how anything else, there's pain involved in that, a bunch. And he stood the whole game. With Freddie watching from the sideline, Texas and Notre Dame kicked off the Cotton Bowl. The Fighting Irish scored first, taking an early 10 to nothing lead. They were not the cleanest football team I've ever played against. My brother Mike is over there near the Notre Dame bench. The next thing Mike realizes is he hears a bunch of yelling from the Notre Dame sideline. Hey, number 86, you, you, you blankety blank. Hey, number 86, you're a blankety blank. Mike turns around to say, what is this about? And he looks over there and it's a, one of the assistant coaches and a Catholic priest are over there yelling at Mike, calling him all these names. And then he looks over there, now Parsegian is doing it, their head coach. So Mike hides himself from the referees and shoots him a finger. <laughs> and when that happened, all three of them came running out on the field. Oh man, even the Catholic priest came running out on the field. It was a tough game. They were very physical. They executed well. We had our hands full. Texas began the fourth quarter trailing 10 to seven. With 10.05 left to play, Ted Coy's three-yard touchdown run gave the Longhorns the first lead of the game, 14 to 10. On the next drive, Joe Theismann hit Jim Yoder on a 24-yard touchdown pass to retake the lead. With 6.52 remaining, James Street and the offense took over. Just one of those things. It came down to a pass again. Here we go again. Texas had to convert a crucial fourth down to keep the drive moving. And just like against Arkansas, it worked. This time, it was a pass to Cotton Spire that kept the chains moving. The ball was a little bit underthrown, and uh, I came back, and the ball was barely off the ground. Billy Dale punched it in from a yard out to give the Longhorns a 21 to 17 lead. With 108 left to play, Joe Theismann needed to drive 78 yards for a touchdown to win the game for the Fighting Irish. And for the second game in a row, a Tom Campbell interception would seal it for Texas. The Longhorns won, 21 to 17, capping off an undefeated season. I intercepted Theismann's pass at the end of the game, and I kept the football. I go up in the locker room, and I'm sitting in the in front of my locker on a bench, and, and I've got that ball that I intercepted, and I'm looking at it, and I'm thinking about what am I going to do with this? I'm, I'm going to put it in a box or something. And then I realize there's a pair of coach's shoes standing in front of me. I mean, I look up, and it's Coach Rawl. And I said, Coach Rawl's going to say something complimentary to me. And he pointed to the football and said, is that ball for Freddie? And I thought for just a moment, and I handed it, yes, sir, and there it went. I'll tell you how proud I am of you. It'd be kind of, you know, an understatement. Uh, I'm afraid if I talk too damn long, I'm going to choke up. But we've got a guy that we love a lot. Ready? Here it is for you. <laughs> There wasn't a dry in that room. That meant more than a national championship. I can't think of anything else we could do for Freddie that would say more about how much we loved him. Freddie, I think, to all of us who knew him, meant courage. To know the likelihood of your fate and still be strong enough and brave enough to walk toward it, not run away from it. I think that's what he meant to us. He was bigger than anyone because he was a little guy whose heart never gave out. The strongest muscle in the human body is the heart. And it is the last thing that it ever gives out. And it will keep beating as long as it possibly can. And we all knew from what we had seen from Freddie that the last 
moment in Freddie's life would be that final heartbeat. And that one heartbeat capsulized everything that I think Freddie stood for. Despite Penn State's opposition, Texas finished the season the consensus number one team in the country, according to all major polls. It was the second national championship in school history. To say you're a national champion, there's no feeling like it. It's you know something you'll take to the gray with you. It defines a lot of what I am today to deal with the vicissitudes of life, the ups and downs, the things that we all have to experience, unfortunately. It's something that lives with you for the rest of your life. It's amazing how unity and winning build each other. You win because you're unified, and as you win, you become one unit. You have to win by being a team, and a team only. And it was. We won the national championship as a team. A team. Top to bottom. I love them. I love them the way that God teaches to love his fellow man. And I feel like I'm a part of them. To have that kind of success is just so rare. Other than your wedding day and having children, there's nothing really that can compare with that. To be able to get through all that, to have that experience in your life is just very unique and it's something that you just can't take away from you forever. Thank you.